economists of the old enlightenment focused their attention on goods and services as the main scarce resources they were trying to think about in designing the economy. And if you open up any economics textbook, you will find that the focus of economics is scarce resources, like that's our specialty. But goods and services continues to be the, the type of scarce resources that is the primary focus. I believe we're in a moment in history when we are in a new enlightenment, meaning we're going to see paradigm shifts in economics, governance, and knowledge systems that I think will parallel the, the magnitude of those paradigm shifts from the old enlightenment. And I actually think that there will need to be a new type of scarce resources that becomes the main focus of sort of the redesign of the economy. So what are the new scarce resources that will and should be the focus of an economic redesign? And I think this is going to be attention as a scarce resource, like human attention, governance energy, community bonds or community development, and adversarial energy such as uh, the law, corporate governance, policing, things like that. And to be clear, obviously allocation of energy resources and physical resources of the earth, as well as labor resources, will be really important in the economy moving forward. It's just that in the old enlightenment, we kind of thought of attention as being secondary and sort of following up where the economic resources go in terms of uh, goods and services. In some ways, I think that order could be flipped because where the attention goes, where people's focus becomes, that will ultimately shape where scarce resources like energy and labor go. And so I think thinking of attention as in some ways the main scarce resource of the economy that will shape values and institutions and things moving forward, I think that's going to need to be a new way of thinking about things. And to place this into context, we might imagine the thinkers of the old enlightenment, they thought a lot about markets and centralized planning, whether that came from a monarchy or a democratic republic or whatever. They thought about how resources moved in the context of sort of the structures, the, these meta structures like markets and money of the economy. And I think there's going to be new and different tools that come into the conversation as we start to think about restructuring the economy. But in the thought experiments that came from people like Adam Smith and Cantillon, they were actually thinking more about sort of physical goods like corn and wool and wheat and how those goods had this relationship with money and the way things were circulating. And of course they had services in there too, like uh, shining your shoes or whatever, in their image, in their thought experiments. And I like to do thought experiments on this channel, but in some ways I think the thought experiments need to start to include more thought experiments that are kind of about what are the ways that these different mechanisms channel people's attention and how, how do goods and services move in following that attention? How do real things like governance energy and the economy move to um, sort of figure out where resources go? Because we do have a lot of digital tools at our disposal for more creative structures for both governing where resources go when it matters for a community of people, but also um, different types of collective intelligence mechanisms besides just markets. And I think as we do these thought experiments, it needs to not just be about goods and services, it needs to include these other things. So I would just like to talk a little bit about each of these scarce resources and why these should become a bigger focus of economic restructuring. So why does attention need to be a key scarce resource? And it has some interesting properties, like my guess is some of you paid for this video with a little bit of your attention on an advertisement. So it's already sort of entered into the economy in a way that, um, in a way that's pretty important and is in some cases linked to money. 
attention is definitely scarce. Like you definitely only have 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the quality of your attention is not the same in all of that time. Sometimes you're asleep. Sometimes you're kind of zoned out and don't have the energy to give like quality thinking, like quality problem solving attention to something. So I think in some ways what the labor economy it buys your your highest quality attention, like those hours in the day when you're focused on a problem and thinking creatively about it, thinking carefully about it. And sometimes I will do these thought experiments where I imagine a world vacuum. And of course you can use the world vacuum to be like, okay, what if we vacuumed up half of the bee population? What would that do to society and things? But I also do thought experiments where I say, what if we vacuumed up half of the attention in the world, like half of the quality attention, and sucked it into something like social media so that there's less of that scarce resource to go around. And given that I think quality attention is essential for things like human relationships and quality problem solving, if you vacuum up half the attention, half of that scarce resource, how does that affect society? Because attention and quality attention is in some ways the number one input into some of the most important things that happen in any economy, but particularly in an information economy. And I do think we live in an age where it is an information economy where information determines how how physical goods move, where scarce resources get allocated. And so the kinds of things that require attention as an input include governance, community formation, labor of any type, problem solving, quality relationships. There's so many things where the main input into that thing is quality attention. And this includes like quality information. Like where does quality information come from? It comes from somebody who's thought about something and done a lot of research, putting their quality attention into figuring out what's true or not true about something. Or a community of people putting their collective attention into into coming up with knowledge that they have decided is valid. And in the past, I do think we've thought of attention as a secondary thing. Like first we focus on our job, first we fo focus on how we're allocating things through markets, and then our attention will just kind of play out however it plays out. And economists like to think about efficiency. So we like to think about how do you use resources efficiently? And when are we using resources really inefficiently? And when I look at today's economy, I think we're using a lot of the attention resources really, really inefficiently, where you have a lot of attention focused on things that are um, either not that important relative to other things that need more attention, or else maybe they are important, but putting more and more attention in that direction it doesn't actually make progress. It just sort of uh, feeds to a loggerhead that is already stuck. And so if we were to stop and think, okay, how could we use human attention in the most meaningful, important way to solve the economic and governance problems of the world? I just think that's a problem that um, first and foremost has to start with how would we want to allocate scarce attention? Now, to be clear, I don't think dictating to people or forcing attention is in at all the right way of doing this. But attention is related to attraction. You, you do hire people to spend their time and their attention solving certain problems. So thinking about the allocation of that resource without making it into a um, into a coercive thing, I think that's that's important. And some people will say that attention is holy. Like where you choose to focus your thought energy, where you let your mind dwell, that will shape your values, it will shape who you are. And collectively as a society, where we put our attention will determine the values that we evolve into. And so the question is, are we evolving our attention in a direction that does solve the problems we want to be solved? Are we, are we, are we collectively focusing our attention where it is most holy? Now, the second scarce resource that I think we need to focus on as a scarce resource is governance energy. And this is because governance energy is really expensive. Like it does require attention as a scarce input, 
but it also requires sort of a willingness to compromise. That takes a long time. It requires a willingness of populations and people to enter into conflict over things, to work through that conflict, to come up with something. And if you were to look at every single decision someone made that impacted a, a group of people bigger than their own immediate family or whatever, that that list of decisions is so large that the world does not have enough governance energy to collectively make all of those decisions. And when I say governance, I'm not just talking about the types of governance that happens in Washington, D.C. I'm also talking about the types of governance that happens inside corporations, because of course corporations make decisions that deeply impact society. And there is a governance structure within corporations that sort of um, is headed by a board of directors that's accountable to the shareholders and whatnot. And some of the decisions that are made inside companies like uh, companies that involve artificial intelligence, for example, some of those will, I think, need a better governance mechanism that's, that includes a, a broader range of people that's more democratic. So when I say governance, I'm talking about any decision that impacts a larger community other than the people making the decision. And what I'm saying here is that list is so large that there is not enough governance energy in the human population to make every one of those decisions collectively. And yet, I do believe in the principles of democracy, that especially for the most important of those decisions, there does need to be democratic input and democratic processes that determine those things in a way that is acceptable to, to many people. And, and what I'm seeing right now is a ton of governance energy going into these bottleneck moments that happen every four years where we vote in an official way. And the issues where public attention and public discussion goes are issues that are such at loggerheads that there's not any progress. Whereas I do think we could actually find a bunch of things that the broad part of the population widely agrees upon. And those things are not getting any attention at all. Like those, those things sort of fall, fall to the wayside of these, um, these loggerhead issues. And that tells me our governance energy as a population is being wasted and is not being used efficiently. Now that we have some pretty powerful digital tools, the question is, can we come up with other mechanisms that will not waste this precious governance energy? And then my next scarce resource is community formation. Because people cannot be in an infinite number of communities, they cannot know an infinite number of people really well. And when I look at the current economy, one advantage I see that large corporations have is that oftentimes those are the only places where people form real community bonds, where they've interacted with people over a long enough period of time to know everybody's quirks and to know how to navigate conflict with different people, to know people's strengths and weaknesses. And it takes a long time for a community to sort of come together and know each other well enough to figure out how to function well as a group like to figure out when certain people should step up because that's their strength. Like some people are great in crises and other people are, are horrible in crises. They, they panic and uh, become a burden. And I think communities can naturally sort of deal with that well if they know each other well. And what I see right now is these huge mega organizations, which is basically corporations and bureaucracies of various sorts, those are where these long-term relationships happen. And of course, because every organization, every community can depreciate, like, like large communities can stop serving their social purpose and instead turn their own energy into the internal power dynamics and internal struggles within an organization, that's no good. But we need communities to develop because of the power of these communities. And any economic system that does not involve communities forming, communities investing time and energy getting to know one another, I think it's leaving too much good stuff, too much meaningful, important stuff on the table. 
And that's one critique I have of a lot of thinkers in the sort of space of thinking about a future economy is that it doesn't have places or mechanisms for community formation where that's a scarce resource and it needs to be cultivated and used carefully. And then my last scarce resource is what I'm calling adversarial energy. And here I'm really thinking about things like uh, corporate law, that, that's sort of where I started thinking about this issue, but it includes policing power and military power and really the entire law, not just corporate law. But why I started thinking of this in the context of corporate law is because so many corporate lawyers, I think, by their own admission, believe that they're sort of just contributing to rent-seeking. They're just contributing to the power battle between different corporate entities, rather than actually adding real value to the economy. But the skill set of corporate lawyers, that is an incredible skill set for sort of identifying where there is corruption, where there's a problem in the system that is not serving its pro-social role, you need some way of sort of going after those problems in the system. And corporate law is actually set up well where it could do that if that energy were focused differently. So all of the jokes about lawyers causing problems and having a bad role in the system, I don't think the solution is to get rid of lawyers, where lawyers are basically people who do a lot of research and careful thought to defend a certain position, to perhaps go after something that is that they are claiming is not right. And if the thing they're going after is just sort of, okay, somebody who's threatening the power of a corporation, that's no good. But if the thing they're going after is actually, wait a second, we have something really wrong with what's going on here, and that you need information to go after that to sort of prove, no, this is something we don't want. That kind of thing it could be so valuable in essentially creating an immune system for the economy. And this is a white rabbit video. And the white rabbit is a reference to Alice in Wonderland, where of course, Alice in Wonderland, you're going underground down a rabbit hole where everything's weird and distorted. And why I have this white rabbit on the channel is that I think we need creative economic thinking where everything's different and weird if we want to get to a better economic system. So this video is me sort of exploring how might we rejigger the way we think about economics in general.